Let's talk about this matter of the law in James now, first of all, this morning, and kind of relate that more broadly to New Testament teaching, because obviously uh, one of the, the big matters we're going to be concerned with all morning today is a holistic biblical theology, uh, in which on the one hand, we uh, uh, view James with integrity in terms of what James himself wants to say. We do our hard work in the individual book, the texts of that book, and we, we really seek to understand James in his own terms. And that's a very important point that we're going to be making several times this morning, in his own terms. Um, everyone uses language in the context of a, a broader framework. And what our particular words mean very much relates to that framework within which we're using them. I think we kind of all intrinsically understand that, that this is, one, this is one of the barriers to human communication, particularly when we're talking sometimes across cultures. Uh, a word in a certain culture, uh, even the same English word, uh, will have a set of associations because of that culture that it doesn't have in a different culture. So when we're just comparing word to word, uh, we can really get into trouble in trying to understand each other. And often it takes the, the, the additional step. Uh, now, what does this particular person mean by this word in terms of his or her framework or what Ludwig Wittgenstein called a language game? What language game is being played? Uh, and so the task in biblical theology uh, of, of pushing toward a whole unified biblical theology uh, must begin with the individual author and how that particular author in that particular book is using particular language. And then we derive from that a concept. Here's the concept James is trying to get at. And to describe that concept, we may choose to use the language that James uses, or we may choose to use other language. Quite appropriate, as long as we are accurately describing the concept. Well, then we go to Paul and to, to John and to Peter and Matthew and so forth, and we do the same thing in each of those authors. Uh, and then we end up with these, these concepts, and then we seek to integrate the concepts. A lot of people try to do biblical theology simply at the level of word agreement. And that just doesn't work, and you just get into problems trying to do that. You know, one thinks, for instance, of the way the word semeon, sign, is used in the Gospels. Uh, you read through uh, the Gospel of John, and of course, one of his key emphases is the recounting of the signs of Jesus, that people might have faith. You go to the Gospels, and what do we have Jesus, I mean, the, 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 the Synoptic Gospels, sorry, and what do we have Jesus saying there about a sign? I will give this generation no sign. They're bad things. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah, the resurrection. You're not going to get any other signs. And so we say, oh, there's a contradiction in Scripture here. Now, the, the word sign is being given a bit of a different meaning in each of these books, you see. And uh, that is something we just need to recognize throughout Scripture. And when we're seeking then to push toward a holistic biblical theology, uh, uh, the work is a bit harder in that way. Please understand also that some of the issues we're talking about this morning, in a sense, are issues that are peculiar to those of us who have a high view of Scripture. Uh, uh, people who don't have our kind of view of Scripture don't need to do this hard work. They can study James and draw a conclusion, James is teaching X. They can study Paul and conclude Paul is teaching Y. They're contradictory. Fine, we're done, so what? They, they contradict each other, they have different views of this, different views of that, and let's go on. And then perhaps as Christians today, we can pick and choose which of those views we like the best, uh, Paul's or James or somebody else's. Sometimes it's none of the above. Um, but as evangelicals, we, we, we recognize uh, the unity of Scripture, and we want to maintain the unity of Scripture, and the unity of Scripture is something we must not just proclaim but it is something we need to show and demonstrate by the hard work of theological integration. Uh, and that's what we're talking about doing this morning. 
Let's begin by looking at this uh, background in Leviticus 19. It's pretty obvious once you look at Leviticus 19. Uh, a lot of people have pointed this out that James uh, in his teaching in the book seems to be uh, particularly oriented toward this section of scripture. Uh, these are not all of the parallels. I think Balkum has several others in his little treatment of this matter. Uh, again, pretty widely recognized, suggesting that when James is um, giving his teaching here to the churches, this is a passage that's particularly in view for him in the background. Um, and perhaps the process sort of went again through the love command that uh, James, of course, rooted in the teaching of Jesus, sees him singling out the command to love the neighbor as oneself, Leviticus 19, 18, and that then draws James to Leviticus 19 uh, and says, well, maybe it is fair then for me to unpack the central demand of love by looking at some of the other things that this text in Leviticus calls on God's people to do. And so he brings in these other matters that you can see uh, have their parallels uh, in uh, the epistle of James. So that's kind of an initial point to look at. Uh, let's remember also about uh, the language James has used about the law. We've looked at this now uh, yesterday in the passage we were discussing. Um, and uh, there are five points here and I'm gonna add one. There should be one more on this list actually. Uh, we, we noted yesterday that, that James moves from the language of the word of God, the end of chapter one, and, and morphs uh, uh, sort of subconsciously without any explanation into the language of law. Uh, so again, you have word, verses 22 through 24, but then suddenly we have law, namas, the Greek word, of course, in 25, which, however, James uh, defines. He talks about a perfect law of freedom, uh, a law that gives liberty, that brings freedom, probably is the way we're to construe the genitive. That's what the TNIV has decided to do there, that law of liberty means a law that brings liberty or brings freedom. And I think that's a pretty obvious interpretation of that genitive in this case. Uh, I, I can't really imagine what else that genitive could mean in this case. Uh, the law that gives freedom. Uh, similarly, we, we noticed yesterday as we come to chapter two and James talks about this uh, love command and, and he says, the law is according to that command and it is a royal law. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, in the same context, uh, James does refer to the Decalogue he cites commandments from the Ten Commandments, obviously, as illustrations of his point. Uh, and then the point that I do not have up here that I should have is that, again, in verse, tw in, in verse 12, when James is talking about the law judging, he again calls it the law that gives freedom. Again, he qualifies it in that way. And then finally, a sort of negative point, a, a kind of point of silence. Um, is the fact that, that in the letter of James, he makes no mention of what we might call distinctly Jewish issues, circumcision, food laws, festivals, uh, these matters that uh, are often explicitly brought up, uh, for instance, in the letter to the Galatians, where you have the issue about the law there. So, all of this then kind of needs to be uh, taken into consideration when we're trying to ask, when James talks about the law as having continuing significance for the churches to which he's writing, what is the law he has in view? What law does he have in mind? Now, um, on the one hand, uh, there are uh, are some who think that, that, that James is using language that suggests he has in view not the Old Testament law per se, but rather what we might call uh, New Testament law or what Paul calls the law of Christ. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, and that, that all of these qualifications and the silence on this point uh, suggests that he again is thinking about uh, New Covenant law, not Old Testament law per se. And obviously James mentions Old Testament commandments uh, 
uh, but he mentions them simply as part of the new covenant law that uh, has uh, uh, now been taught by Christ and the disciples. And the, 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 the Decalogue is cited not because uh, it is authoritative in terms of the Old Testament law, but because these are brought into the New Testament law. I think the best advocate of this, unfortunately, is a German scholar, Franz Musner. So you're probably not, most of you probably won't be able to read him firsthand, but uh, uh, he's, he's the one who, who most clearly argues this view in the letter of James. And I must say, in terms of my broader theological convictions, I like that view. But there are problems. First of all, there is the problem of the fact that James quotes famines from the Decalogue to illustrate his point. Um, second uh, is the context in which James is writing. Uh, the language that James uses about the law, perfect law, the law of freedom, is language that has been used in the Jewish world before him to talk about the Torah, the Old Testament law. So it's not as if this language is entirely new. Uh, it's not as if James suddenly is using language about uh, the law that no one has used before, and clearly he must mean something new and different by it. This is language that has been established uh, in Jewish usage, and I, I quote some of those parallels in the commentary. Uh, moreover, the fact that James doesn't refer to distinctly Jewish issues might mean that he simply assumes them. I mean, we know from the New Testament that many maybe most Jewish Christians continued to observe the law as Christians. They no longer observed it as a, a way of salvation. Uh, they, 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 they no longer uh, viewed the sacrifices as essential since the sacrifice of Christ had come. But again, we have, we have pretty good evidence from a lot of places in the New Testament that Jewish Christians uh, often continued to observe uh, the law uh, as a way of expressing their, their piety and their faithfulness to God. And that, that could simply be assumed by James then. Um, now, on the other hand, again, let me turn back to another issue. Um, James is filled with uh, clear allusions to the teaching of Jesus. And a lot of this uh, comes in the kind of form of the wisdom tradition. And here I'm moving beyond my commentary a bit. Um, one of you here in the first row, I overheard one of you, I'm, I'm gonna find out who it is, it might have been you, was saying, you know what? Moo's lectures this week sound more like Bauckham than like his commentary. Was it you? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, <laughs> There's some truth to that. I have been very impressed with, with Bauckham's work. Uh, I, I disagree with him at, at a number of places, as, as I've been indicating, but I, I, I've been very impressed with it. And in a sense, he, some of these issues, he represents a number of other people who've been writing kind of some of the same things, which has, uh, again, uh, fed my thinking on this. As I said in the past, I've sort of had this uh, irrational distaste for wisdom uh, in terms of a category to interpret the new Testament, and I'm trying to overcome my prejudice uh, on that point. But, but the, 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 the point would be this, is that when, when you have in that kind of a tradition uh, reference to uh, the law, uh, I do think that James uh, probably has the Old Testament law in view, but I also think that because of his dependence on the teaching of Jesus, uh, and the way he integrates the teaching of Jesus and the love command itself, for instance, um, that it is the Old Testament law as filtered through Jesus. Uh, it is the Old Testament law now as taken up by Jesus uh, in his teaching and then passed on through that filter to the churches of his day. In other words, I think some of the language James does use here, and I think particularly this word royal in 2.8, um, suggests uh, this, this new way of thinking about the law. So that James is not simply passing on the standard Jewish view of the law here and assuming it, but he is rather Christianizing his view of the law. And let me just, just, just turn to that word. Of course, you have it in 2.8 there. The Greek word is basilikon as a description of namas. 
And you remember that it's a just in this context, verse 5, that James has specifically referred to the Basileos, the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. In this context then, I think the, the language of verse 8 means something like uh, the law about the kingdom or the law that belongs to or pertains to the kingdom of God that the Lord Jesus has brought into existence. Uh, just about all the versions do simply translate royal here. And, and, and yeah, that's accurate enough, I think. The word can mean that, and that's probably what it means in a lot of these Jewish texts in the background. But in James' contexts, uh, I would, it would be awkward. I don't know how I'll well translate it for sure, but something like if you really keep the kingdom law, if you really keep the law of the kingdom of Christ, uh, which is according to the scripture. Uh, and so I think there James might be alluding to this kind of new way of thinking about it. Now, I want to move on from James in a moment, but let, let's see if you have questions on James particularly. Hasn't that pushed you right back into the interpreting the royal law as the law of Christ? or, you know, what Paul would refer to as the law of Christ? In some sense, I think so, yes. Um, Is that inappropriate when you're trying to systemize and do a, a whole biblical theology that covers both James and Paul and hearing God above both of them? Now that, I'm not, I'm not clear what you're asking on that follow-up question. I, I understand, you know, we've got to see James on his own terms, but when he's pushing you back in that direction, and then you see Paul referring to the law of Christ, um, could that not be that they are referring to the same thing because God's the author behind both of them? Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, when you, when you say, is it not inappropriate, that sounds like a question expecting the answer. That sounds like a polite way of saying it is inappropriate. I, I'm sorry, just scratch that I'm, part of it. I okay, I just, I was not... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm slow. I'm not tracking this morning. But, uh, but would it be right as biblical theologians to move in that direction? Um, are we not giving James his end? You know? Again, it's a, it's a very fine line to draw between giving James the integrity of what he wants to say in, in his language, in his context, and so forth, which, we, which we, we very much need to do, at the same time as we recognize that ultimately, because of our view of scripture, the Bible is one book with one author, God. And that at, 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 at some level, then it is, is legitimate to interpret James in light of Paul. Now again, it's a very fine line. Because to, I, I worry when I say that because so many people have just too quickly tried to flatten out scripture. That they've really not read particular texts and given them the force they're designed to have. They've just too quickly tried to, again to flatten it out, take a steamroller to the whole thing and, and make it all say exactly the same thing without seriously grappling with what each text is saying and what with, with each book is saying. So again, I, I wanna make clear the work in individual books and texts needs to be done. We need to give integrity to that, but it seems to me uh, an inevitable implication of our view of scripture. And one of the more important reasons why we have this view of scripture we have, one, one of its key applications is precisely our belief in the unity of scripture, the authorship uh, ultimately of God of all of it, so that there is a legitimacy to interpret James in light of Paul or Deuteronomy in light of Romans uh, or Romans in light of Deuteronomy. <laughs> um, just as when you're you know, reading and again, the, 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 the analogy is obviously not exact because of the way scripture is broken up into so many different books written over so much uh, of a period of time. Uh, when you're reading uh, a novel and, and, and you, you read something in chapter two and, and, and it's maybe not quite clear what it means or you think it means uh, something, but maybe by the time you get to the end of the novel, oh, suddenly you come back to chapter two and say, oh, now I see chapter two meant something a little different than I thought it did when I first read it there. Uh, and, and, and so you, you sort of look at the parts in light of the whole. So I guess that's a long answer to say, yeah, I think it's appropriate in that way to say, um, I, I wanna try to find unity between James and Paul, let's say on this. Did that answer your question at all? I think so. <laughs> it might influence 
it might influence the, it's exactly right. So that the, what scripture says elsewhere will have an appropriate influence on conclusions we draw in any given part of scripture. And now again, very fine balance is needed here. We, we have to, we can't just arbitrarily read one part of scripture and another part of scripture and fail to do our work. Um, that, would, that, would, that would in effect to deny the form God has given us scripture in. He decided to give us 66 books written over thousands of years by different people with different personalities. And uh, we need to respect that. Uh, we, we, we need to, uh, to honor that in the way we read the Bible, interpret it and apply it, um, even as we're looking for the unity. You don't, you don't assume James means what Paul means. Right. But you also don't assume when you come to James that you you know exactly what Paul means. You may think you know what Paul means. That's right, yeah. So, if, but James may help you realize you might not really understand exactly what Paul right. means yet. Uh, and that's a very good good, good point. My, my former colleague and good friend, Grant Osborne, has written you know the book, The Hermeneutical Spiral. And uh, that language of the spiral has become, I think, a very appropriate analogy for biblical interpretation because, uh, again, you're constantly moving uh, and hopefully moving upward and, and understanding scripture better and better. But you know, thought you, like you say, I thought I knew what Paul was saying. Now I come to James, oh, maybe I need to come back to Paul. And then maybe you say, no, I still think I was right on Paul. Let me come back to James again, you know? And we, we spend probably all of our interpretive lives doing that. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with admitting, yeah, I'm changing, I'm growing, I, I'm moving. As pastors, I would encourage you on the one hand, not to, you know, keep retracting sermons you've preached the week before, because that, that's not going to give your people a lot of confidence in what you're doing. But on the other hand, it points to say very honestly, you know what, I've changed my thinking on this. Help them see that, yeah, a faithful Christian who's really seeking to understand and live under scripture is going to move and change and develop. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that. Um, because that's, 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 that's this wonderful process of, of, of keep you know, spending time looking at little bits of scripture and integrating. I'm going to come back to that again this morning. So my own experience. Well, in fact, let me talk about that now. Um, um, because I want to come to the broader issue of the law. Um, we've already talked about this, basically. Um, and look at some of the options here. Um, the, the first option, uh, and we think historically and more broadly theologically, about uh, the Old Testament law and the Christian believer, because that's sort of ultimately what we're talking about here in one way or another. Uh, mo most of us will be familiar with this first model that I hope you can understand from the diagram. Uh, I'm not terribly good at this visual stuff, but I'm trying. Uh, uh, very deeply uh, built into the Reformation and particularly uh, the Reformed uh, tradition and the Puritan tradition within the Reformation, which has had a very significant impact upon modern evangelicalism, uh, is this idea of uh, the, 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 the three different parts of the Old Testament law. Uh, this tripartite division, which uh, is, is historically very significant, ceremonial law, civil law, moral law. Um, and I think in many ways, uh, coming out of the Reformed Puritan tradition, into modern evangelicalism, perhaps the most popular option is to see a continuity of what we might call moral law. That Christ ends, in a sense, by his fulfilling the ceremonial law, his death on the cross. Uh, Christ brings to an end the, the civil law for, for this period of time, at least. Some of you will probably hold an eschatology that sees it maybe reinstituted in the millennium. I, I don't know exactly what views all of you hold on that. Um, uh, but that, again, you, you can sort of go to the Old Testament and, and there's a sort of implicit red letter version of the law uh, where, where, where some of the bits are in red. And that's the moral law. And, and that Christ simply came and reestablished. He interpreted, he explained it in places like Matthew 5 and uh, brought it over sort of intact for the people of God of the new covenant era. So there is this continuity of moral law. And that was the view I had held. That was basically what I was taught as a seminary student. 
I'd gone on and done my doctoral work and came back to teach at Trinity and really had a lot, had a lot of time to think about this, but uh, I was uh, engaged in a lot of conversations in those days with uh, Don Carson, my colleague, and some of the work he was doing. And so yeah, I should really take a look at this myself. So I kind of just assigned myself a course in advanced Greek exegesis in which I said, hey, we're going to go through all of the key New Testament texts on the law. And it just kind of be a good way to do advanced Greek exegesis. So we'll be getting all parts of the New Testament. We'll be trying to work at a theological theme. Um, and so I, I started that process, holding this view. And, um, you know, I, I would come to a text, and I can remember very uh, vividly thinking, oh, boy, this, this text, as far as I'm exegeting at this point, doesn't fit my view real well, but, but it can fit. Uh, you know, I, I can, if I, you know, uh, squeeze a little bit here and, and, and give a little charity there, uh, it, it works. And, and, and I kept doing that. And then there came that moment. I think I've always thought that Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm change makes sense because it happened to me and it's happened to me a number of times. There, there comes that moment when you say, enough evidence accumulates and suddenly you say, you know what? Maybe this whole thing would make better sense if I change the paradigm. And suddenly all that starts falling into place, you see. Now, that new paradigm might create its own problems, of course, but I think, I think that's the way fundamentally human beings work. I referred to Thomas Kuhn and his paradigm shift. Are you familiar with that? A uh, very influential book about the way science progresses. And it's been criticized, uh, I think appropriately, as far as I can see, by a number of people for being sort of over the top and too simplistic. But I still think there's a lot of truth to it. It's, uh, the best analogy is the Copernican revolution. You know, you just, you just picture these medieval astronomers looking at the motions of the stars and the planets uh, and trying to make sense of it all with the Earth at the center of the universe. And, you know, they were coming up with these fantastically complicated mathematical formulas. Oh, now, how do we explain the movement of that planet? It goes this way and then reverses, it seems, and keeps going that way. Well, you know, here's a complicated mathematical formula to explain that. And, you know, the math just keeps getting more complicated and complicated and complicated and complex until finally someone like a Copernicus, a Copernicus comes along and says, hey, you know what? Suppose we put the sun in the middle of all of that. Suddenly, all of that falls into place so much more neatly, you see. It's a paradigm shift. Um, it's sort of the paradigm shift that Paul underwent on the Damascus Road, who had lived his life as a Pharisee with Torah at the center of things. And then suddenly, he says, I've got to put Christ there. And then everything else changes, you see, and, and, and takes a different configuration. So that sort of happened to me. And I came to a different view of the law on that basis, which I'll come to in a moment. I don't know if theonomy is very popular or not. I, I think it's kind of died out. It was sort of an ultra reformed view uh, that was popular for a while that wanted to argue that there is no good evidence that the civil law has ended. And, and so that, that, that the, the, the civil law of the Old Testament remains in effect for this era. Um, uh, and again, I, 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 uh, Greg uh, Bonson, uh, Rush Dooney, uh, uh, North, uh, I forget all the names of the people. Uh, I, think, I think that's pretty much faded now. It was, it was uh, kind of a hot issue back in the uh, late 80s. But the, the view I finally came to is, is uh, I think, better described in this model. And it's, uh, I, I admit, simplistic. Any model is going to be a bit simplistic. Number one, uh, as I was looking at, at the way the New Testament approaches this matter, I became uh, suspicious of the familiar tripartite division. Uh, it might be helpful as we look at the Old Testament law to think of these different parts uh, and the way they work, but there is, is virtually no evidence that Jewish thinkers at the time of Christ uh, thought that way about the law. There, there's very little evidence within the New Testament that people thought that way. To be sure, Jesus, Matthew 23, 23, refers to the weightier matters of the law. Uh, some parts are more significant than others. But, but no one thought about the law as sort of divided into distinct parts. The tendency rather was, as Paul suggests in Galatians 5, to say, if you want to be circumcised, you have to do the whole law. It's a piece. And that's pretty much what James says here also, isn't it? In James 2, uh, 10 and following. 
uh, if you break one part of the law, you are a law breaker. So I'm unconvinced that we can divide the law that way, that the New Testament authors will, were thinking that way. And I also came to the conclusion that Jesus claimed to be the fulfiller of the law, Matthew 5, 17, um, is a way of talking about his uh, himself embodying and bringing to eschatological conclusion the law as a whole. And so here's the model then that, that seems to me to represent the New Testament teaching broadly and basically uh, more effectively. That God gave to the people of Israel uh, the law for them, for their nation, for that period of time, as Paul puts it in Galatians 3. The law, which was added 430 years after Abraham until the seed should come. And, and if you look at Galatians 3, that's strongly temporal argument, suggesting that God gave the law of Moses for the people of Israel for particular purposes for a particular time. Christ now is the one who fulfills the law by teaching its eschatological form. Uh, and thus, uh, I think when Paul talks about the law of Christ in Galatians 6, 2, uh, similar language, 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 22, uh, he is referring to the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. This is the new covenant law under which God's people now live. Now, uh, you've seen me, some of you have read articles in which I've argued this view. So uh, you, you, could, you could follow out those articles if you want and see more detail in my argument there and uh, rebuttals to my view as well. So that's always a useful thing to have people uh, poking at the weak points. Um, I, I must say that, that as I've worked in James again over the years, uh, I feel the need to tweak a little bit, that it's a little bit more complicated than, than, than this is the case because if you look at James, he seems to be saying more, it's the Old Testament law as fulfilled and interpreted through Christ not so much the law of Christ, which has some more general relationship to the Old Testament law. So I, I, I would not, I'm certainly not about to retract the view I hold. I still think it's basically right, but I would you know, want to nuance it a little bit in terms of the way in which uh, the, the, the New Testament law, the law of Christ takes up within it uh, and, and, and does uh, stand in continuity with certain basic moral teaching of the Old Testament law itself. Again, just how to package it, I'm not sure. Sometimes I've toyed with the idea of distinguishing between sort of form and content. That the content of what we might call the moral law of the Old Testament and the moral law of the New is identical. God obviously hasn't changed his morals over time, but that the form in which we have the law is different now. Uh, some have used the analogy, you know, the law of the state of California and the law of the state of Oregon, uh, which on most kind of fundamental, we might call moral issues, will be the same uh, in content. But if you happen to be uh, living in California, it's that law that you have to follow, not the law of Oregon, as it were. Um, so I think this can be integrated if we can come back to James then, and, and in which I think he's using language in which he's saying, I'm not just talking about the law, the Old Testament law, per se, uh, uninterpreted, just, just taken straight over. But I think he's hinting at this idea of uh, a law that is in some way being transformed, is being fulfilled, is being channeled through Christ and his teaching, and that, that this then enables us to, to put Paul and James on the same page, even if they are in slightly different places of that page in terms of their emphasis. John is talking about throughout 1 John when he talks about the commandments of God, would that be the same? Would you see that as the same uh, point of reference, the law of Christ? If we obey the commandments of God, that's how we know we love Him and they are not burdensome to us? I, I think so, yeah. Again, it's, in some of these passages where you don't have much explanation, when there's simply reference to the commandments, it can be difficult to know precisely what's being said. 1 John is an example, and the 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, 19, 21, I forget the verse there. What counts is neither circumcision or uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Uh, what are those commandments? Um, and again, here's where I, I, I'm a little bit more comfortable occupying a kind of 
fine middle road. Well, maybe, or it's a reference to the teaching of Jesus and his commands. First John, because of the love command there, again, you might argue that very persuasively. Uh, maybe it's certain Old Testament commands as taken up and fulfilled and applied to us in Christ, you see? Precisely where you put that emphasis, I'm not sure sometimes. So uh, I think that on the whole then, we could integrate James uh, uh, effectively and appropriately with the broader New Testament understanding of the law now that stands over Christian believers. Uh, and again, kind of the, the, the practical implication of, of my view is that when we were, we're talking about um, the commands that are to guide the expression of love, you remember this uh, slide we had? Um, we talked about the centrality of love, the need for the renewed mind, and the transformed heart, and that needs to be the center of things, but we're still guided by commands, that, that those commands are, are now fundamentally the commands we find in the New Testament rather than in the Old. Um, uh, this is sort of the uh, implication uh, of uh, what I see the New Testament to be teaching on this matter. Questions further on this uh, whole issue of the law then? Yes? So how do you deal with, uh, how do you explain when Jesus said, I didn't come here to abolish the law yet, and I agree with you, by the way, on exactly on what you said, but how do you, how do you make that, how do you make that scripture fit, or how do you, do your explanation fit the scripture yeah. that said, you know, on the one hand, the law Christ gives way to the law of Christ, which in Christ was very specific, he didn't come into the law, the law of fulfillment. Um. Yeah, two points on that particular verse. One is the whole matter of what the word fulfill means there. Um, and of course, that's a very significant theological word in Matthew. Uh, 15, 18 occurrences or something, many of them with particular pieces of scripture. You know, this prophecy <laughs> was fulfilled when Jesus did this or that. But also more broadly, uh, Matthew uses the language of fulfill. He talks about fulfilling Israel's history, for instance. Out of Egypt, I've called my son. Uh, this was fulfilled when Jesus came out of Egypt and so on. And uh, very significantly for our purpose, he uses it in conjunction with the law. Uh, and the point I want to make is that the language of fulfill then does not mean interpret the law. It doesn't mean to deepen or radicalize the law. Uh, it means that Jesus in his teaching brings the eschatological law to which the Old Testament law pointed forward. The prophets look forward to Christ, he fulfills the prophecies. Israel's history looks forward to Christ, he fulfills its history. The Old Testament law looks forward to Christ, and he fulfills it by, in the Sermon on the Mount and other places, bringing teaching that is what the Old Testament law itself was pointing ahead to. So when we look at the contrast then of fulfill versus abolish in the context, that's, that's how we need to understand this to be working. I did not come to abolish it. I'm not removing the law from the canon. I'm not telling you not to read it. I'm not telling you it's not God's law. I'm not telling you it's even authoritative for you anymore. What I am telling you is that I have come to give the teaching to which that law points forward. And you now have to understand that Old Testament law in light of my teaching. Again, the, the, the shift in, in, in the Copernican universe here. Christ is now at the center. And that's the kind of bold and even startling claim he makes in the Sermon on the Mount. You have said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And quite appropriately at the end of the sermon, people basically are saying, who does this guy think he is? And that's just the point. <laughs> uh, Jesus is suggesting who he thinks he is. Uh, he is God himself. He is the uh, Messiah bringing in the kingdom of God and uh, telling God's people uh, what they are to do, how they are to behave, and how are they live directly from his own authority, not basing it on the law or tradition or anything else. Uh, so I think, and the gospel of, of Matthew corresponding to that, when Jesus sends us out and commissions us, what does he do? Teach the Old Testament law as I fulfilled it? No, teach everything I have commanded you, you see. So I think when he says, I did not come to abolish it, uh, what he's doing there is responding to, I think, some criticism of Jesus, who's been saying things like this, and people are getting the impression, oh, Jesus is, is, is just wanting to do away with the law entirely. 
No, but he is wanting to put it in its context now in light of the um, coming of the kingdom of God. I think in that text, the more difficult passage from my view, indeed for almost any of the views that, 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 that we Christians hold is the combination of verses 18 and 19. Not a jot or tittle shall pass away from the law. Uh, you must do and teach even the least of these commandments. Boy, that, you know, that context there can sound like an endorsement of every commandment of the Old Testament law that we have to continue to do and teach. Now, every Christian has problem with that, of course, because uh, whatever we think about all of this, there's, there's general agreement on the basis of the epistle to the Hebrews, most clearly, that, that God's people don't have to continue to do the sacrifices and observe the festivals and so forth. Um, so to the, I think those are the more difficult verses, to, to be honest, for the kind of view I'm arguing and, and Christian views in general. Yeah? So when James is using um, teleos or perfect or complete, you're, uh -huh. not, you're thinking of the eschatological form of the law. I am. I, I think, yeah, I haven't, I haven't specifically mentioned that, but yes, a good point to bring up. I think he probably is using the word in that sense of the law that's now been brought to its completion in a sense, to it, its full authority and sense in the teaching of Jesus. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't want to belabor this point if there are no more questions. I don't see anybody uh, who is uh, rushing here to, yeah. So does that, uh, does that connect to the law of freedom? The, this idea okay, yeah, about? yes. I, I think it probably does. And I, I confess that, that it, it's harder when you're looking at James to understand why he uses that particular description. Uh, the law that brings freedom. Because clearly James does not want to say, you're under the kind of law that gives you free reign to do whatever you want. Uh, he has too much very specific to say about our obligations to God and his will for us and so forth. Um, but I think he might be using it, and I'm not at all sure about this, very tentative, but he might be using it in light of the uh, new covenant prophecy that I think James alludes to in verse 18 of chapter one. The word, I'm sorry, of, of uh, 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 verse uh, 21 of chapter one, the word that has been implanted in you. And in a sense, that new covenant prophecy talks about, I mean, I'm not sure freedom is exactly the right word, but says, you know, no longer will we have to be looking at, at, at tablets of stone, but the law will be within us. It will be something that is natural to us. And I think maybe the idea of freedom has to do with that idea of being uh, free uh, to um, uh, uh, be guided by this internalized law in, in this new way. Uh, some have taken this in the sense of free to truly obey God for the first time. That, that, that now that Jesus has come to perfect the law, to fulfill it, uh, in that process, he enables the people of God for the first time, in a sense, to truly do the law, to be free to do it. But that's, that's reading an awful lot into the language of freedom there. And I, I like the idea. <laughs> I'm just not sure that we can push James' language quite that far. Well, let's uh, at least uh, begin now our uh, look at 2.14 through 26. Uh, what I want to do, just so you know the the kind of um, uh, outline we're gonna follow. Uh, I want first simply to sort of work through the passage and to see what's there, to look at some of the specifics and details and exposit the, the, the text. And, and once we've done that, and of course made some comments along the way, uh, at the end of the day then sort of, we'll try to come back and look at the bigger theological question a little bit more. Uh, what's going on then with uh, justification here in Paul and his relationship with James and, and how can we uh, understand that. 2.14 through uh, 26 is another one of these pretty obviously self-contained units. Um, uh, again, it's a longer section of James, uh, quite different from the uh, very quick aphoristic sort of structure of most of chapter one, for instance. Here we have James obviously developing a, a single point over uh, a significant series of verses. Um, let's just get sort of the structure of it first. 
and I've uh, uh, underlined uh, the, the key emphasis that James keeps coming back to. Um, faith without works. It's pretty clear uh, what he is teaching against. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at the details of this, of course, as we go. He introduces it in 14, gives us an illustration in 15 to 16. Repeats the idea in 17 again. Faith without works is dead. And kind of uh, uh, gives another, uh, moves his argument forward by citing an objection to his view. I'll come back to this, by the way, in case you're not getting it all now. Um, and then in 20 to 26, again, we have the faith without works emphasis and a little bit of what, again, we might call an inclusio, um, as this, this little paragraph begins with uh, the idea of faith without works being useless, ends with a similar emphasis, faith without works being dead. And then within that, we have illustrations, Abraham and Rahab, uh, very similar language that James uses here for both. And then finally, sort of in the middle of the paragraph is the kind of central theological statement uh, about justification. How does this paragraph relate to its context? Uh, three points. Um, one, most immediately, it picks up some things James has just said in verses 12 and 13. Remember how he ends this, this paragraph on the issue of um, uh, partiality and favoritism, and as he's quoted the law, he, he really ends with a pretty serious warning. Um, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. It's almost as if James is saying, no, don't, don't take this language of the law of freedom too far, uh, as if this is a, a law that you don't need to worry about, uh, that really you just have freedom to do what you want. You don't need to be concerned about it. Uh, know that you are going to be judged by that law. And so speak and act as those who are going to have to face that judgment. You can understand then why James might raise the question that he does in verse uh, 14. Because behind the scenes, he sort of can, can, can hear people that he knows about, that he's heard from, who are saying, but James, we know that faith is all that we need. Faith is all that we need to survive the judgment. Uh, this is what we're hearing, that uh, faith alone is all that we need. And as long as I've made this profession of faith in Christ, um, uh, I don't have to worry about the judgment. So why are you telling me that I need to worry about being judged by the law when uh, my faith is something that uh, takes care of that entirely? And I think it's clear, again, in the background, we're having to reconstruct some things, that, that James hear people saying this who aren't leading very consistent Christian lives. Uh, people who are, uh, again, faith only people in the sense of a, a faith apart from an obedient Christian lifestyle. People who are claiming to have faith but are not living the Christian life. That's why James asks the question the way he does in verse 14. Faith without deeds. Can someone explain to me why the NIV and the TNIV following it uses deeds here? I need to bring that up on the committee. I, 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 there must be some reason for it. Every other version uses works. We're, we're familiar with the word works elsewhere as an English translation for this Greek word. I don't know if they're trying to, is there, is there a particular point that, that's being made by using deeds instead of works? Are they trying to soften the difference between Paul, you think? You think so? Maybe, just in the English terminology? Yeah, that's, that's a really bad thing to try to do that way, if they are. I don't know why they do that. I, I don't like it personally, but uh, at any rate, I just happened to think of it when I saw it here again. <clears throat> uh, so I'm gonna use works instead of deeds. Um, but you see the, you see the question, uh, what good is it if people claim to have faith but don't have deeds? So you see how this can emerge out of this warning about future judgment uh, in verse 12, in which James seems to imply uh, 
that how we act is going to be significant in the ultimate judgment, you see. And, and again, that sparks the whole issue. Well, and I know some of you are saying, oh, we don't have to worry about that, that that's all done with. We're in the Christian era now in which uh, judgment is something we, we don't need to bother with because of our faith. Um, and, and you can see how James would perhaps be attempting to correct that view. Um, a, a second way of thinking about the relationship here uh, to the context uh, is, of course, to think about this whole matter uh, of faith that James has been talking about throughout the letter. <clears throat> he brought it up, you remember, in, verse, um, in verses six through eight originally about having asking in faith, uh, not doubting. <clears throat> and faith is something that James has a concern with in terms of a possible separation from works. So that's another theme. And then, of course, third, in a more, even more general way, uh, it, it's obvious here that we have another uh, example of this whole broader question of what it means to be a doer of the word and why doing of the word is significant and how it relates to some of these other issues. <clears throat> but <clears throat> all of that having been said, here again, uh, for my brother in the front row, I disagree with Baucom at this point. You hear that? Okay. Um, I'm not a slavish follower of Richard Baucom, um, uh, who, who again wants to say, uh, James and Paul have no kind of relationship at all. That, that, that the only relationship they have is entirely indirect. They're both working with some of the same texts of scripture and Jewish uh, traditions. I think again, I still think it's much more likely that, that what we have here is James responding to people who have heard Paul preaching um, and have misunderstood Paul or have deliberately perverted Paul in their sinfulness. Um, and that's what James is responding to, this misunderstood Pauline view that he is familiar with from these people in his churches. <clears throat> All right, um, let's then kind of work through the uh, text here. Uh, at, please ask your questions about the specifics as we go. <clears throat> uh, James begins again by asking a question to try to involve his readers. <laughs> what is the profit? If someone, and note the way he puts it again, you know, uh, James does not single out a particular target here. Uh, and note again that it's an if statement. Uh, and again, this is why uh, uh, people will often say, well, James is really not writing to any particular church or particular issues. He's just sort of in a more general way talking about possible tendencies that could crop up anywhere. There's a certain truth to that. But on the other hand, we have a lot of evidence in the New Testament that this kind of language will sometimes be used as sort of a, an indirect way to indict somebody you know, where the author says, now, <clears throat> if someone should say, and he knows very well someone is saying that, but, but you put it that way to, so that people sort of have to identify themselves in a sense. Um, now, if it should be that someone should say, uh, and it has rhetorical effectiveness, you see, uh, just as, you know, if you're trying to bring up a delicate issue in your congregation, and you've heard someone say that, but you know, you don't want to stand up there and point the finger at that person and kind of get immediately into a confrontation. And so you say, no, if, if some of you might say that, you see, and I think that's what we have in this passage. I think James knows some people are in effect saying this, but for purposes of, uh, in a sense, the way he develops the argument for the purposes of rhetoric, he puts it in this way. <coughs> What is someone saying? Someone is saying that they have uh, faith, but do not have works. Now again, it's, it's, it's unlikely someone is going around saying, I have faith, but don't have works. Um, uh, I, I think James is using the language of someone saying to kind of represent their position, you see. Now, it's possible someone is actually saying that. Well, let, let, let's admit that is a possibility because we have examples, I think, in Christian history at least, maybe not explicitly in the New Testament, uh, of Christians being so excited about God's grace and about faith that they, they, they might even boast in the fact that 
They have no works. And it doesn't matter because it's by faith and by grace, you say. There are a few extreme statements in Luther that sound like that. And again, this is not Luther's settled, dispassionate view. This is Luther in extreme rhetorical mode, you know, countering people who are putting so much emphasis on works in which he'll, he'll say things like, I have no works at all, so what? It's God's grace and my faith, that's all that matters. You know, and he doesn't really mean he has no works, but, but he's putting it that way. So it's even possible someone is saying that, but I don't think we have to conclude they're using just this language. Now, James has left open here what the prophet is. Well, what, what kind of prophet, you know, he says, what's the prophet if someone has a prophet for what? I think the second part of verse 14 clarifies. Uh, is faith able to save that person? And if, if you look at your text here, you'll, you'll see that the, 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 the text puts this in the form of uh, expecting the answer no. That uh, uh, we, could, we could paralyze, we, we could paralyze, paraphrase, at least I haven't said Paul yet today, um, <laughs> inappropriately. Uh, faith is not able to save that person, is it? The King James Version translates basically like that. And if you look at the King James Version, it can almost sound like James is saying, faith doesn't save. Most contemporary English versions, however, recognize that the function of the article here with the word pistis, faith, is what we call anaphoric, that it's referring back to uh, an immediate idea in the context. And so most of the, uh, or I'm not sure about most, but many of the modern versions, I think quite appropriately here translate, can that faith save? The kind of faith I've just mentioned, the faith that doesn't have words. I think that's a quite appropriate interpretation of the language. Certainly the article can function that way. Uh, and in the context, I think it's pretty clear that's what James uh, intends here. Can that faith, the faith I've just mentioned, the faith of someone who claims to have faith, but has no uh, works. Um, yeah, such faith in the TNIV, that faith, uh, ESV, that kind of faith, NLT, uh, that faith uh, in the NASB, note the NASB, you know, a literal version. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Net Bible, can this kind of faith save him? You see that they all, they all are, 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 are making that point there. As far as what the person is saying, and, you know, I have, uh, someone <coughs> says he has faith. Um, is it possible, I mean, it makes more sense to me that what James is saying is that somebody says they have faith, and that's, that's what they're saying, that's their claim, okay. and yeah. what James is saying, but by viewing them, they, they just don't have words. So they're, they're not saying, I have faith, but no words. Um, you, 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 you could be absolutely right there, yes. It's a, let me just check some, something real quickly here. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think our versions generally use any quotation marks here at all, do they, at this point? But, but you're absolutely right. It's an issue we're going to be talking about again in verses 18 and, and 19, as we all, I think, understand. There are no quotation marks uh, in the Greek New Testament. And usually we can figure out where a quotation begins because of a, of a transitional statement. But where a quotation ends is very tough. You know, that's why did, did, did Jesus or John say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Is John 3.16 something John is quoting Jesus as having said? Or is it something that John himself is saying? Very hard to know. We know that there's a quotation that begins in John 3, but where it ends, you look at English versions, they put the end of the quotation all kinds of places. So you're absolutely right. It could be that James is saying something like this. What does it profit, my brothers and sisters, if someone says, uh, uh, I have faith, end of quote, but they don't have works. It's possible to interpret that way, yeah. Most of the translations, like the ESV says, he has faith, but does not have works. So that, you know, it's very, no, nobody says, well, anyway, um, and like the NASB, he has no works. Uh, New King James, he does not have works. Yeah. So, you know, at least the translation. It is possible to take it that way. It sure is, yeah. That's a good point. 